Mm. So this talk is a bit strange, maybe. That's about Kafka. Normally I talk about use cases that I, I like demo applications that I've built with, with a variety of open source technologies, or in some cases um, for Kafka in particular, benchmarking the results that we've, we've got. Um, this talk I, I decided to cheat in a sense. I asked our own internal people what data they had about Kafka that they could share with me that I could then have a look at and try and come up with some profound conclusions. So that was sort of the background to this talk. Um, I work for InstaCluster. We have a managed platform for um, a variety of big data open source technologies. Check out the free 30-day trial. Um, you don't have to provide any sort of details or anything. It's free, no obligation, and you can try all of these technologies uh, on the developer-sized instances. So that's a good way of getting some hands-on experience for some of these technologies. Some of them are painful to set up yourself. Um, and we've done it for you. So, but the focus of this talk is on Apache Kafka in particular. Um, oh, no, you're going to do the timing, aren't you, Stefan? Yep. Yes. I haven't timed this talk. It could be five minutes or 50. We'll see. Um, oh, just a, a quick shout out to um, Franz Kafka, who, the, who Apache Kafka is named after. So apparently on June the 3rd, that was the centenary of his death. So, uh, and I was there the day before in Prague, which is how I got here by train eventually. So there's a really cool 10 meter high sculpture outside one of the shopping centres in Prague and it's supposed to move but it's busted at the moment so, so it's just, just a static um, head at the moment. Um, so this is a talk in four parts. I'm going to talk briefly about Kafka scalability, Kafka clusters and ZIPFS law, clusters and storage and then what the real focus of the talk was intended to be and sort of still is, um, looking at uh, our top ten Kafka clusters and some performance metrics that I managed to get for those. Um, so just a, a thanks to some of my colleagues as well, particularly Alastair and the Kafka team for some of the data and for the top 10 clus cluster data I actually got that from a couple of our tech ops people who were very helpful and have worked with me over the last few months to get that data and that's Joseph and Romana. So. And just a note about Kafka cluster metrics, this will come up a few times in the talk so I thought I'd address address it right up front. Um, the focus of our operational metrics is really on Kafka brokers, on the broker level metrics. Um, and that's great because that's what our operational people are all about, is keeping um, Kafka clusters running for our customers. Um, but I was interested more at the cluster level metrics, which we have some metrics available, but not, not as much at the cluster level. But what I was really interested in was the um, performance metrics over all of our clusters. And that, of course, uh, turned out as something that's not actually something we collect by default. And it's not necessarily very easy to get either. So it was a lot harder to get some of the, the data um, about all of our clusters. But relatively easy to get data at the broker level. So a bit about Kafka scalability. Um, I assume most people have come across Kafka at least at some, some level, and at a very high level, it's a distributed stream processing system uh, which allows distributed producers to send messages to distributed consumers via a Kafka cluster, which is itself distributed, which gives you the, the scalability and concurrency aspects. So again, at a very high level, um, Kafka is a cluster. It's a cluster of brokers. Uh, sometimes I'll use the, the terminology node, our internal tech ops people think of everything as a node because we started out with Cassandra and that's the Cassandra terminology but a node and a broker is just a, a, a machine instance essentially. Um, so as well as the hardware you've got the software aspect of concurrency in Kafka which is partitions. It's a fairly important um, and, and relatively complicated topic and I won't go into much detail but you'll see partitions popping up occasionally. Um, essentially by combining the hardware, the horizontally scalable hardware plus partitions you get a write and read concurrency for a Kafka cluster. Um, so, yeah, uh, consumers are an important part of the concurrency story in Kafka. Um, partitions essentially enable multiple consumers to share work. So it's a bit like the Amish barn raising where you get lots of people involved. So within a single consumer group, you can have multiple consumers all sharing, um, sharing work. You can also have multiple consumer groups, which enables message broadcasting. So this gives you the ability to essentially share messages. Um, so the messages are duplicated and there's a fan out as well. 
So if you've got more than one consumer group, you're going to have an increasingly large fan out in your Kafka cluster. Uh, petitions. So uh, petitions are the concurrency mechanism. In general, more is better, except when they're not. So some benchmarking we did in 2020 um, is the yellow line at the bottom there. And you can see there um, that the throughput starts dropping at around about the 100 petition mark, and the throughput was actually, in general, a lot less than the more recent result, which was the 22 one, uh, which we did when KRAFT first became available for Kafka. Um, so the, in general, the throughput was better with, with KRAFT, but that was due to a combination of things, including better hardware at the time. Uh, but the most important thing to notice is that the number of partitions uh, can easily be up to 1,000, and the throughput doesn't start dropping until, until after 1,000. So. Um, so there's sort of a magic number of petitions for a, for a cluster, uh, and if you don't have enough or if you have too many, then your throughput will suffer. So just in general, Kafka scalability and performance, just trying to summarize several talks that I've given on the subject in the past. Um, there's horizontally, uh, horizontal scalability, which is the ability to add brokers or nodes. Vertical scalability, which is the ability to add more or faster instance types um, or brokers. Um, there's the general hardware aspects, um, the number of cores, CPU type and speed, how much RAM, disk, and the network type, and things like that, all affect Kafka performance. And then partitions and consumers, um, you really do need to optimize the number of partitions, and also your consum consumer speed optimization. Uh, there's a thing called slow consumers, and they're, just, they're basically a bad idea, like having uh, a truck being um, carried down the middle of a road, it essentially stops all the other traffic in that consumer. So by default, Kafka consumers are single-threaded. There are, there are some tricks involving multi-threaded consumers and other, other things that you can help to get around that, but essentially they are single-threaded, so you've got to optimize the speed in consumers. Uh, if you have yep, too many consumers, you need more petitions, and as I've said, yep, uh, too many petitions is bad as well. So uh, There's also lots of things around Kafka cluster and client configurations. Many and complex, they can all affect performance as well. Typically for a Kafka cluster though, you're trying to achieve high throughput and low latency. So low, when I say low, about sort of tens of milliseconds or less latency. Okay, part two. So this is where we start getting into the hopefully interesting stuff. Um, Kafka clusters and Zipf's law. So this is all about the size distribution of something. So for example, galaxies. So galaxies come in different sizes from small, or relatively speaking. All galaxies are big, I guess, um, but up to like enormous. Zipf's law. Okay, Zipf's law is a scaling power law. It's a distribution function. Basically, the most common um, or the most frequent observation is twice as common as the next, and so on. So it's one divided by the the rank. It's a long tail distribution. It's it's sort of the same as the 80/20 rule, which is that. 20% of the people own 80% of the money on the planet. Um, it's similar to the to Pareto distribution, which you may have come across with. Um, the interesting thing is if you graph the log, log rank versus frequency and size, that's approximately a straight line. When I say approximately, um, there's a lot of sort of variation sometimes uh, with, with distributions that are close to, to Zipf's distribution but aren't exactly the same. Um, so common examples, and this example here is actually the first one, it's the frequency of words in a language. Um, wealth distribution, I've mentioned animal species size, which I'll mention briefly in a minute. Uh, earthquake sizes, city sizes is a well-known example. Computer systems, actually, in general, um, have a lot of zip-type distributions. Workload modeling, you can model synthetic workloads based on, on zip's distribution, subsystem capacity, and lots of other things. Uh, and galaxy sizes, as I've mentioned as well. So, yep, so galaxies, okay, so you might have a question, which is, well, how large are the largest structures in the universe? And the answer is, well, probably bigger than you've actually ever seen. And Zipf's law predicted uh, that b bigger galaxies would be detected in older parts of the universe. But the problem was, at the time, we only had the Hubble, and that uh, wasn't powerful enough to look back further in time. So when the James Webb telescope came online, sure enough, they, um, they, in fact, found all these bigger galaxies that Zipf's law had actually predicted. Well, what's that got to do with Kafka? So, the first um, lot of graphs that I've got, sorry, there might be a few too many graphs in this talk. If you're allergic to graphs, I don't know what to do at that point. <laughs> Let's pretend there's a cat or something there. Um, 
so this is the summary statistics of all of our um, Kafka clusters that we run for customers. So essentially uh, what it's telling us is that um, the median um, size is 3 for a cluster, the average is 4.5, uh, there's quite a big standard deviation, the maximum cluster size is 96 brokers, um, there are 797 clusters, and in total there are 3,603 brokers in all of the Kafka clusters that we, that we run. So that's a very high level summary. Um, here is the histogram, which, which gives you a sort of a better, better way of viewing the same data. As you can see, the majority of clusters are uh, of size 3, and there's a scattering of other sizes, perhaps the next most common size is of size 6. Um, okay, so Kafka clusters and Zipf's law. Um, so this is, a, this is the actual distribution of all of the Kafka clusters, and you can see it's definitely a long tail power law. So there's a, a few clusters that are very big, and the majority with the long tail here are very small. So that's sort of in contrast to other possible distributions. I've got a blog on this on, on our website, which sort of has some other hypothetical distributions, but so, um, yeah, so that's, it's pretty obvious that Kafka clusters do follow this long tail distribution. Uh, as you can see, as soon as we graph the log versus the log of the, the size and the rank, um, it's sort of a straight line. Um, it, it's a bit messy with this particular data set because there's a lot of size 3 clusters. Um, so that's the big blob at the top left hand corner there. Uh, okay, so what? So assuming it is Zephian or close to Zephian, what can we conclude? Well, the first thing, uh, based on the galaxy um, analysis, we can, is that we can probably expect to see larger clusters. So, for example, in the animal kingdom, um, the current largest animal that exists is a, an elephant, which is, weighs about seven tons. But in the past, there actually have been dinosaurs that are as, as big as 150 tons. So they're not around at the moment. But looking at the distribution of the size of animals, we could have predicted that dinosaurs, in fact, did exist. And we can do the same sort of thing with, with the Kafka cluster data. So um, essentially down here you'll see that the red line continues down and that corresponds to future Kafka clusters that we might encounter that are bigger than the current maximum um, cluster. So it's essentially what it's, what it's telling us is there's probably no intrinsic limit um, based on the distribution of data in the Kafka cluster sizes that we see to the maximum Kafka cluster size. And there might be actual reasons that you can't have bigger clusters, but um, based on this theory at least, that there's a good chance that we will encounter bigger Kafka clusters in the future. So the second so what is that you can actually estimate the total size of a system from the, the available data if you assume a zip distribution. So um, how many total nodes might we have if we had more clusters? Um, well, this is a similar problem to the well-known animal transportation problem that a certain person had when they had to put all of the animals into a boat. Um, so it turns out if you know the size of the biggest animal, you can predict the, the total mass of animals that you've got. So this is a prediction of the total weight of animals on an arc, assuming that the elephant is the largest animal. And you can see there's a, a, the graph tends to around about 90 tons. So it doesn't matter how many species you keep on adding, uh, essentially the, the, the maximum weight of animals is going to be around 90 tons. So that's, that's just because of the distribution and it's a long tail distribution. Okay. So applying the same logic to um, clus uh, Kafka clusters, if we assume that we want twice as many Kafka clusters as we've currently got, um, we'll find out in fact that the increase in the total nodes is only 20, 25%. So rather than um, getting a, a doubling of the number of nodes, you actually only get a 25% increase in the total number of nodes. And that's assuming that the, the biggest cluster is still the same. You can run those numbers again despite changing that assumption and, and saying, well, maybe what, what if the biggest cluster is twice the size? And you can do the computation as well. <coughs> okay, so part three, we, this is where we're actually starting to look at some slightly more concrete data. Um, so we're having a look at storage capacity for all the Kafka clusters that we run. So this was data that became available recently due to an internal project that uh, had a requirement to understand the, the amount of disk that we were using across all the clusters. 
So I sort of piggybacked on top of that information. Here's the raw data. It's the total disk per cluster. Um, and on the x-axis, we've got the, the number of nodes per cluster. So that's increasing from very small three size up to the, the maximum size on the right-hand side. Um, and what have I got? On the y-axis, it's the disk and terabytes. So, so you can see there's actually quite a good correlation between um, cluster size and disk size, which is sort of what you'd expect. So this isn't an unexpected result. Um, uh, perhaps interesting is that we've got about 5.6 petabytes of disk across all the Kafka clusters. Um, that's quite a bit of data that's sitting there being used by Kafka. Uh, sort of looking in a bit more detail about what's going on potentially here. Um, so disk space used is a function of average write rate times average message, message size times the retention period times the replication factor, which is just using Little's law essentially to compute that. Um, our metrics are total disk available, not used. So some of these clusters may in fact be using no data at all. I can't tell. Um, some of these clusters are actually in the development environments, not the production environment. So they, they A, don't have real workloads, and they may have a RF um, of less than three, potentially. Um, I've used the number of nodes essentially as a proxy for cluster size. Um, I mean, that, that's a bit vague. Um, it may not actually be, be completely correct. Uh, the Kafka log retention policy and time impact, how many messages are retained as well. Um, Kafka clusters are sized for peak load, not average load. Some clusters may be a lot older than others, and this can be increased over time as well. Um, and also the, the, the read, or the right read workload um, balance may not be the same for all the clusters. So some might be very read heavy, in which case they don't require as much disk. But, the, it, but in general, there is a bit of a correlation there. So we finally get to the, the bit that sort of is the interesting part, or the part that I thought could, be, uh, could result in some interesting conclusions. Well, we'll see what happens. So ranking, OK, so this is uh, a bit of some Australian background at this point. Uh, what are the most dangerous Australian critters? Well, ranking can be a bit tricky. So does most dangerous mean the ones that have the obviously most teeth, uh, the most venomous, um, or perhaps the most obvious way of ranking things is um, by how many people they've killed. So, but if you do that, in fact, it turns out that none of our native animals are particularly um, deadly to humans. Uh, horses, cows, and dogs, and bees, in fact, kill more people than uh, all the native animals put together. So, so ranking is sort of a bit of a tricky exercise anyway. Um, and again, just a bit of an overview about the metrics that are available for Kafka clusters. So for all of our clusters, I could find the size of the cluster and the type of the instances, um, the size of the disk, which came from a, a recent project. Performance metrics are collected for all the clusters, but they're not easily available um, as the focus is per cluster. And as I mentioned, it's per broker, typically, that the metrics are collected for. So what I did was essentially ask, um, I put, it, put in a special request to get some performance metrics for the top 10 clusters um, based on some definition of the top 10. And what did I get? Well, I got some of the static data per cluster, the number of nodes, number of topics, and the number of petitions. Oops, 10 minutes, okay. Thank you. Um, and then for a 24 hour period, I got per broker, things like resource utilization, throughput, and some performance in terms of latency. Uh, so just a sort of a warning thing there. Um, there's a whole lot of assumptions about this. The data turned out to be not particularly easy to interpret, not particularly accurate. Um, this is a snapshot in time for real workloads, not benchmarking. Um, yeah, and the results therefore are sort of speculative. So here's some summary statistics, the number of nodes, topics, and petitions. It just gives you an idea of the range that we saw. Um, topics ranges from seven to 17,000 per cluster petitions from about 2,500 up to half a million. So there's a big range in the top 10 clusters. Um, CPU also ranged uh, quite dramatically from quite low utilization to quite high utilization. Um, the data in and out is there as well on the messages in and out. Uh, latency was interesting. The producer latency was, was pretty fast. Some of the consumer latencies were were relatively slow for some of the clusters, which was interesting. And um, this shows the consumer latency distribution. So about half of the clusters had a sub-50 millisecond latency, which isn't too bad, in fact, but some of them were, were a lot slower than that. Uh, message size and bytes, 
range from 150 to 3 k bytes. Um, and so we, there's actually a metric that's missing from Kafka, which is the total messages in and out, but I could actually compute that once I knew what the average message size was. So here's my computation of that. So for the biggest cluster, in fact, we were getting 25 million messages in and out a second. Fan out ratio is the ratio of um, data coming out of the, the cluster compared to coming in. So it was interesting, it was actually quite a big, big spread from just 1.4 1, 1 to about 28 times. So that, assumed, that, that implied that there's 28 consumer groups potentially for that cluster. So and again, assuming the zip distribution, um, so knowing the metrics for the top 10 clusters, we can estimate total values for all clusters. So these are some of the guesstimates that I came up with, 27,000 topics in total, 5.8 million petitions and maybe up to about 564 million messages a second. Um, some more static data for the top 10 clusters. Um, we had between 27 and 96 nodes. Uh, this one, I've tried to have a look at the topics and petitions and the nodes in a bit more detail, just to see what the ranges were and if there was anything strange. And it turns out that um, there's, well, there's two clusters that, that stand out. One is the biggest one, which does actually have the most topics and the most petitions. Uh, there's also another one, which is um, cluster number six there, which actually has what I call the hottest topic. So that's got the highest petitions per topic out of all of them as well. And that, that is actually one that our tech ops people had identified as being interesting and a similar result here looking at the CPU utilisation. There's a couple of um, standouts in terms of how heavily utilised those clusters are. Um, so one which is apparently the hottest and another one which is, which is relatively hot as well. And then well, I thought, well, let's see if there's any obvious correlations to cluster size. And this is where things sort of got a bit, bit fuzzy. Um, first of all, topics. Uh, in theory, and our tech ops people say, well, there's actually probably not going to be any correlation, really, because the number of topics you have in a Kafka cluster aren't related to the throughput or the size. It's, it's, it's a, just a data modelling thing, essentially. And sure enough, the correlation was only 0.4, so there's no, no great correlation there. Um, and there are some smaller clusters that we know of that have a, a large number of topics, so they're not even in the top 10 in terms of size. What about size petition correlation? Well, petitions are related to throughput and size in theory, uh, and sort of in practice. It's not, not a particularly good correlation, but there is a, is a trend, as you can see there. Uh, size and throughput, um, yeah, poor correlation. Um, size and throughput, looking at the maximum throughput again. Yeah, the, the only thing that's sort of obvious there is the average and peak throughput does correlate with this hot cluster, which is the, the 60 one there. Um, so one of the problems with this data is that they're real workloads, so in a 24-hour sample period, that doesn't necessarily correlate with the, the cluster capacity in any sense of the word. Um, the other thing I noticed was the top 10 clusters have quite heterogeneous hardware. There's, they're not all the same by any stretch of the imagination. They use different types of disks, which are, uh, have different speeds, uh, and lots of different instance types. So, yep, there's quite a lot of difference going on there. Uh, so looking at cores per cluster, there's actually a reasonable correlation, which is perhaps not surprising, because as you have bigger clusters, it's just inevitable that you have more cores. Um, I asked the tech ops people for a bit more information about the biggest cluster and the hottest cluster, and this is what they said. Um, they said the biggest one is over-provisioned and it uses the slower EBS um, disk type. Uh, and it does have a fairly high consumer latency, which they think correlates with the fact that they're using the, the slower disk. And it runs fairly cool, so it's not, not over-utilised at all. It does have the most petitions, though, out of any of the clusters we have. So half a million petitions in a production environment is, is a fair number of petitions for a Kafka cluster. The hottest cluster, on the other hand, um, runs pretty hot. The CPU is up, up there. Um, quite high most of the time, but it's also got the lowest consumer latency and they, they put that down to the fact that it's got the faster SSD type disks um, and even though it's got what I call the hot topics, uh, the most petitions per topic out of the top 10, it's, um, there's something interesting about the workload I think, um, meaning that it's pretty fast. So, uh, looking at those graphs and this one in more detail, it does show a problem that I had, the metrics are actually per broker and have wide variability. So this one, the reported um, average time for this was 290 milliseconds, but there's actually quite a big variation there. So 
uh, and I don't have this level of detail for all those top 10 clusters, unfortunately. Uh, can you use any of this data for capacity planning? Well, I wouldn't recommend it, but it does give a very broad range of um, things that you can, can aim for. Um, so for a particular target throughput, you can try and work out how many cores and petitions are needed, and in practice you need, need both. So I've, I've sort of come up with a guess for, for ranges of, of things. So actually trying that for a particular target um, clusters, assuming double the size of the current maximum cluster, this sort of gives a range um, of TPS and millions of transactions a second per core. Uh, from a sort of pessimistic to an optimistic, well, so optimistic to a more pessimistic range, and the same for partitions as well. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't trust any of those results in practice, but it does give you a sort of a, a feel for the potential range of things. So, conclusions: um, Kafka cluster size distribution is pretty close to Zipian. There's lots of small clusters. There's a few big clusters. Uh, you, we probably should expect to see even bigger Kafka clusters at some point in the future. There's a wide distribution of sizes, um, and this is intrinsically because Kafka is horizontally scalable. Uh, it fits many different customer workloads. Some customers have many small clusters, in fact. So they, um, they've intentionally had more than one cluster to, to serve multiple workloads in their environment. And some clusters grow in size over time. This was only a static snapshot. Uh, it would be quite interesting looking at the change of some of these metrics over time as well. Um, the top 10 clusters are sort of diverse. They're all, they're all different. And to me, this is the main takeaway that I, I came away with. There's a wide, wide range of workloads, throughputs, hot versus cold, CPU usage, fan outs, latency, message sizes, and hardware. And there's some interesting odd ones out, the biggest and the hottest. Um, the performance metrics were biased and coarse grain. Uh, due to the broker level collection and the 24-hour sample on average and the summary of that data as well, and from real, work, from real workloads, not benchmarks. Uh, it's hard, hard to find correlations and make accurate predictions from that type of data. Uh, but we did, did find some broad correlations and range predictions. Uh, cluster, customer, uh, sorry, custom cluster, <laughs> this is a bit of a mouthful, custom cluster optimization and sizing. Uh, it apparently is quite normal for our managed Kafka clusters, um, particularly the bigger ones. So usage and workload varies widely for customers, including how many topics they've got, petitions, and all the things you'd, you would expect. Uh, many bigger clusters are dedicated to very specific customer workloads and have been highly optimized for those workloads. Uh, and it's quite likely that the higher throughput clusters are not representative of lower throughput clusters. Hardware varies and is optimised and customised to take into account uh, the specific customer workloads cost, uh, which is important, and customer SLAs as well. And finally, can we actually do performance prediction? Well, yeah, performance prediction from coarse-grained metrics feels like deja vu to me. Um, prior to joining InstaCluster, I worked uh, in an R&D environment and a startup where we developed an automated approach to performance modeling from distributed application traces. And that essentially solved the problem that I was hoping to solve by looking at this Kafka cluster data. Um, how would you apply that for Kafka? Well, you could instrument Apache Kafka source code with open telemetry, which would provide you with Kafka-specific uh, resource plus time spans. You could then run Kafka benchmarks on representative hardware, um, collect and transform those open telemetry traces into a performance model, and then make more accurate predictions, um, more accurate than what I was able to do with this, this coarse grain data, hopefully. So that's another, it's a future potential project. Uh, and that's all for me, so thank you very much. I hope that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs>